Hello and welcome to Pearl Planning Spring Economic Update and Investment Outlook. This is Melissa Fradenberg, Financial Advisor in the Gross Point Pearl Planning Office. And I'm so pleased to be joined by our founder, Melissa Joy, Alexa Kane, Pearl Planning Financial Planner, and Hannah Neer, Financial Planner with Pearl Planning. And today we have a lot to cover. So um, let's just review our agenda. Today, we are going to talk about the current markets, the US economy, we're going to go through some of the geopolitical risks, talk about inflation, rising rates and fixed income, we're going to address the question on everybody's mind, which is, are we headed for a recession, and of course, talk about how do we invest from here. So with that, I'm going to get it started. Let's take a look at the current market. So. If we look here at the um, S&P intra-year declines, the year-to-date number on this chart is through Friday, the 22nd. We were down about 10%, which puts us in correction territory. However, over the last two days, we're closer to that 13% that we hit back in February um, as the markets have sold off as well. So what I do wanna point out here is while it's been a rough start, it is in line with other intra-year declines that we've seen, in fact, on average of 14% decline. And not only have markets recovered throughout the year in, pat in the past, but also 32 of the 42 years, we've ended the year positive. So this is, we're still early in the year. Um, probably more alarming to investors is what has happened in the bond market. Again, through Friday's close, the US Treasury index is down 11.3% and the US bonds index down nine and a half percent. So Hannah's gonna go through um, in a little more detail what exactly is going on there, but I did just wanna point out, in case you did not know, it has been um, a rocky start to the year for investors. What's interesting though is, even though the markets have had a rocky start, the US economic fundamentals remain strong. So um, if we look at the last four weeks unemployment, the um, average is actually uh, the record low since the Labor Department started tracking in 1967. And also in chart number one, we look at withholding taxes are rising, uh, have risen 20% year over year, which is the fastest pace on record. So people are employed, they are earning more. Um, if we look at CapEx, uh, which is business spending, that remains strong. Corporations have record cash on their balance sheet at about $2 trillion and continue to um, spend, which um, is certainly a driver for the economy. On chart number three, you see that lending standards have been easing for three consecutive quarters. Banks have loosened lending standards, which is an indication that banks are confident in our economy as well. On the next slide, again, the leading economic index is at record high. So through March at 119.8. Um, and in the past, uh, this index has peaked an average of 12 months before each of the last eight recessions. Not only have our um, economic fundamentals remained strong, but we are in the midst of earnings seasons and earnings season and 81% of the companies that have reported have beaten their estimates. There have been a few uh, surprises, mostly those that uh, benefited from the pandemic of the work from home um, situation. So it's not necessarily alarming, but that could have had an effect on some um, markets over the last few days. The next two weeks are huge as 60% of the S&P uh, 500 companies will be reporting. And if those estimates continue to be positive or beating estimates, I should say, then we should see that help stabilize the equity markets and just a, an additional sign that uh, the US economy is resilient. So with that, with the strong economic fundamentals and positive earnings, why is it that our markets um, have been selling off? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alexa to talk about some of the reasons why. Melissa, so I have yet to cover the international impacts that are weighing on our market. So I don't think my topics are surprising because they're all over the news, but the, the first one is the 
continuing conflict with Russia and Ukraine. We're now entering a third month of conflict. So, you know, it's concerning on a humanitarian level and for all the people involved, but also as it continues on just the negative impact for the global economy and our financial markets. So the slide shows kind of what Russia contributes to the world. And so with, you know, them having such a big hand in these commodities, we've seen those prices skyrocket over recent months. Um, the EU has been in talks to finalize an embargo on Russian oil, and that would just further the pressures there. Um, for Germany, they said it would be roughly 5% in lost output for the year with that embargo. <laughs> um, so just a lot kind of riding on what happens with Russia and Ukraine. And um, one thing they were talking about is with Russia's Victory Day um, on May 9th, some experts were saying that may be a day that the conflict eases, but others are saying, you know, with Putin, it may be a day of increased conflict. So just a lot of uncertainty with everything going on over there. Um, and the next slide just kind of shows where the where that's impacting us. So not surprising, we've all seen it at <laughs> the gas pumps, the increased gas prices the grocery store also impacting metal prices as well. So we're, we're all seeing the impacts of what's happening over there on our, our lives here in the US, but also a big impact on the EU countries as well. Um, then the next one, um, at the end of March, we were having um, some good news on the supply chain pressures um backlogs were coming down delivery times were also coming down and we were seeing inventories go back to to pre-covid levels but of course more recently we've had the the lockdowns coming back in in china so um you know the videos are are crazy my brother-in-law is actually in shanghai and it's been <laughs> hard to see what what they're going through, but also, you know, knowing the, the impact it has on the supply chains as well. Um, just Shanghai is only about 4% of China's GDP, but they do have the busiest port and the third busiest cargo airport. So the, the shutdown there really is having a huge impact on everybody. So these numbers here, freight flows in Shanghai, down 80% this month, over 500 vessels waiting outside its port. Um, and so we're just going to see supply chain issues kind of coming back relative to, you know, where it was before. And without um, an easing on the lockdowns, that sort of thing, uh, the supply chain issues will just continue on for, for the future. So another... <laughs> Another issue there. Um, <coughs> so for us, the consumer price index um, rose eight and a half percent over the last 12 months ending in March. Um, the slide on the right shows uh, an average household in the US. So a lot of households saw an increased earning um, for the monthly earnings. That shows about $400 more that a couple is taking home. But as we talked about, we're seeing the increased gas prices. Grocery costs are also substantially up. So it's showing that people have, you know, about $60 less to take home. Um, it does talk about student loans, but we have extended that. So that part is not <laughs> relevant there. But it's just saying that the costs are up. A lot of people are cutting back on spending, uh, but people have kind of been prepared. And the US um, had about 2.5 trillion in cash deposits on hand more than before. So people do have that savings to kind of make up for that. Um, we're looking at 
adding more jobs, wage increases just to kind of help offset those inflation risks. And so I'll let Hannah take over and talk more about <laughs> what the Fed has in store for us. Thank you, Alexa. Um, yeah, we just wanted to kind of give you an update on Fed expectations. So um, while the Federal Reserve can't do a lot in terms of supply constraints, they do influence demand. Um, so the Fed chair is feeling confident that the central bank can kind of engineer this type of soft landing, um, kind of getting inflation back to about the 2% long-term goal that they had. Um, but this is still while maintaining a strong labor market. So um, financial market participants are a little bit more doubtful. Um, and this could be a lengthy process, but the Fed is kind of behind the curve and has a lot of ground to make up. Um, they were convinced early on that this pickup in prices that we've all been feeling um, reflected kind of more of a, a transitory state, um, mostly kind of a rebound in prices that were depressed during the lockdown and just kind of those usual supply chain um, restart pressures, which we see typically after an economic downturn. Um, however, by early fall, price increases has really broadened out, broadened out, and um, near-term inflation expectations have risen, but the long-term inflation expectations did remain anchored near that 2% goal. Um, so this outlook kind of assumes that if inflation doesn't come down on its own, that the Fed would take steps to make sure that it does. Um, inflation expectations do play a pretty significant role in the Fed's policy decisions. However, the current issue is this kind of mindset um, around inflation. So supply chain issues and strong demand have driven inflation higher. But what we're seeing is that a lot of companies are raising prices just because they can. Um, and even though that might be short term, it is a little bit of a cause for concern. Um, so moving on to this next slide, um, we wanted to touch base on the bond market. So Melissa touched on this earlier. Um, the bond market has been bearish. Um, this is primarily driven by shifts from global central banks amid this kind of rising inflation pressure. Um, expectations for an accelerated pace of tightening has driven both U.S. and European bond market yields to the highest level we've actually seen them since about 2018 and 2015. Um, so we'll move on from here. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about repricing. Um, so even though performance has been a little bit depressing in the fixed income market this year, the actual outright levels of yields across the entire fixed income market have improved quite significantly. Um, we do think a lot of um, this kind of front-loaded move in the global rates market is a little bit overdone, so we don't actually expect rates to move substantially higher from here, um, just kind of given the current economic backdrop and everything going on right now. Um, with the inflation scare kind of expected to recede in these upcoming months, 10-year uh, treasury yields should kind of start to stabilize and grind lower um, as we head through the rest of this year. Um, credit spreads have also started to widen again, and this is just kind of um, a reaction with the market dealing with fund outflows and increased supply. Um, there's this kind of back and forth pull between the growth and um, the growth narrative and the inflation narrative, and this is likely to weigh on credit spreads. But we do think um, underlying U.S. growth and corporate health remain really solid. So this should support the markets once Treasury rates stabilize. Um, so on this next slide, we wanted to talk a little bit about interest sensitivity. Um, we have all seen that mortgage rates have started to increase. We're at about 4.7% right now. And um, corporate interest rates have actually moved higher on short-term loans as well. And these, uh, both of these factors are kind of accompanied by government costs expected to increase in the relatively near future. Um, our country has about 67% of debt that's coming due in the next five years or so. Um, so with the U.S. economy being vulnerable to high interest rates, we do think that this might lead to kind of a self-correcting mechanism of cooling growth in the markets. So finally, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about tightening cycles. So it's really important to keep in mind that 
Fed tightening cycles do not imminently end the bull market. So um, you can see here that past cycles, um, the average number of year from the first hike to the end of the bull market is about 3.6 years. And the average performance from that first hike to the end of the bull market is about 104%. Um, so just kind of something to keep in mind as the Fed does start to make these moves. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Joy, and she's going to take a deeper dive on market outlook. Thank you, Hannah. And I appreciate the perspective from Melissa and Alexa as well. I think that the mood um, of consumers and investors has shifted significantly over the last three or four months. And I'm hearing it in the certainty of what's next. Um, I think that what I notice is that people are seeking out the certainty of a crystal ball saying, here's what the, here's what's happening next. Inflation is a big deal. We agree. Um, rising interest rates are a big deal. We would agree. But then there is a leap to, and this creates an inevitability of a bear market as well as a recession. And we deal in probabilities, not certainties, unfortunately, when it comes to investing in the future. Um, but dealing with probabilities and dealing with a process that is built for a variety of market environments is how we think we can accomplish your financial goals and expectations over time. And so I wanna talk a little bit about outlook and what might be probable. And then we can go back to how this should be incorporated into your financial plan. So to start, you can see these headlines that um, you know, are selling papers or creating clicks, talking about the inevitability or the odds of a recession um, that are significantly growing. And as we alluded to before, there are some indicators that we can use to see what's on the horizon. Now, of course, it's impossible to know exactly what's happening in the future, um, but the Federal Reserve, um, the St. Louis Fed, has a um, recession probability number that comes out monthly. And um, the most recent number was from February. And so January's number was 0 0.02 probability and February's number was 0 0.00. Um, and part of the reason for this is some of the indicators that we can see here. Um, in this table, you can see the numbers in the middle are the number of months um, after a peak when a recession presents itself on average. So, um, because these are some leading indicators prior to a recession. And then in the, on the right-hand side, you can see where we are at today. And then we've made it easier for you with a barometer um, conveniently provided by Raymond James Investment Strategy that talks about whether, you know, what's currently going on is good or bad. So um, one thing that's big in the news, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, is a yield cur curve inversion. I don't know if you ever wanted to know what a yield curve inversion was, but I'm going to be happy to tell you about it in a moment. Um, but we've had news that that has inverted and, or not news, but information facts. Um, typically, it's about a year and a half after a yield curve inversion that a recession occurs, and it's highly variable um, from recession to recession. We have a small data set to deal with on that. So that's still relatively green, um, meaning lower recession risk. Um, I assume services is a measure or a survey of um, companies that are not manufacturing companies and their sentiment. And we're just three months from a peak in terms of that number, in terms of actually positive sentiment. It's fallen off just a little bit, but typically we hear from um, companies that are not manufacturers, um, more pessimistic news um, for a longer period of time before um, a recession presents itself. We are all aware of the external factors that are impeding um, US manufacturers. Um, you just can't get your hands on supplies. And I'm not only seeing this in headlines and hearing about it from economists, but I'm talking to our clients, especially here in Michigan, a manufacturing, probably one of the most manufacturing parts of the country, um, dependent parts of the country. And we know there are specific issues that are impeding um, manufacturing. So that is definitely a tick toward um, a higher probability of recession because it's been almost a year that these um, trends have been persisting. Um, meanwhile, though, building permits are only one month from their peak. So there's new building occurring. We know that there is um, 
We know that there is demand for certain types of building um, and um, builders are responding. And NFIB is a small business organization. So you can get numbers from you know, big, big companies, but we also wanna know what's going on from mom and pop shops because they are certainly a um, really strong indicator of what's going on in the world. And they are, they're, they are at their bottom in terms of, there is just not news of poor sales going on when you look from um, company to company on the small business um, scale. So that's actually really good news for the economy. Meanwhile, the consumer confidence index has definitely takes and been a little bit banged up um, with inflation and um, Russia-Ukraine conflict, but it has, it's only a couple months from its peak and leading economic indicators too are within a couple months of their peak. And typically it takes a year for either of those to kind of fall over um, before you have a recession. And then we all know what a tight market it is for labor um, and it's very transient market. So um, people are changing jobs all the time, but um, we haven't seen mass um, you know, upticks in unemployment. And there are certainly changes. The headline in Detroit News this week um, or today is about um, the impact of um, rising interest rates on mortgage jobs, but there are other parts of the service economy that retain demand for employment. Um, so, you know, th this is unpacking what's actually going on under the hood in the economy. And this relates back, all of these factors relate back to indicators that um, can be used um, to fuel what's going on with um, whether there's a recession in the future. We think there is always a probability of a recession in the future. There's, it's not a certainty, it's a probability, and there's always a chance we could go into a recession. Um, but these indicators would indicate that we are not on a screaming level of, you know, the sky is falling when it comes to the U.S. economy. Now let's dive into the inverted, the like very, um, scary term inverted yield curve. So what does an inverted yield curve mean? Well, in these two charts, you may notice that one of the lines is, do, is doing its own thing relative to the others, because typically in bonds, um, the longer you go out in terms of when you get paid back, the money that you lend um, in the form of a bond, then you get paid a higher interest rate. Just makes sense, right? You're gonna tie your money up longer, so you should get a reward. And that reward is that you get paid more in interest. Um, and so short-term bonds typically pay lower interest, longer-term bonds typically pay higher interest. In certain points in time, though, there's a change and um, that can be called, a, or that is a yield curve inversion where shorter term bonds get paid more than or similar to higher, um, higher longer duration bonds. And that is what we've seen more recently. And that is the dark line where you can see that both um, short, the yield curve for short, ter short term investments as well as the long term treasury yield curve has significantly adjusted and changed even from um, the dark, um, the tan line that was just a few, um, one year ago. So this has um, been very um, vaunted in the world of economics because it's seen as a way to predict future recessions. And like I told you, recessions are always a possibility. And in fact, you know, there will be a recession at some point in the future. We know that it's not going to be a constant growth rate. What is a recession? Well, a recession is two straight quarters where we have negative gross domestic products, so ne negative growth. Um, and we can measure in five um, inverted yield um, situations in um, over our careers. In fact, um, that first one was the first month I worked in the investment business back in, or this, um, next to last one, back in 98. So I've seen two inverted yield curves in my career. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because anywhere between, in the last five inverted yield curves, it took between 10 and 34 months. Yes, that's right. Three years to have a recession. And so I kind of wonder whether, you know, recessions tend to happen about every seven years. Um, and so, you know, it, if you just kind of roll the months forward, eventually you kind of run into recession, right? Um, but on average, it's about a year and a half that it takes from the point of a yield curve inversion to um, leading to a recession. And this is part of that drumbeat of, you know, bear markets coming, recession, duck and cover, um, 
Unfortunately, if you listen to the inverted yield curve kind of diagnostic to make your investing decisions, then you typically may um, give up a significant portion of investment returns. So on average, um, investments have had a cumulative return of almost 20% while waiting for a recession to occur. And so this is just another reminder that if you use signals um, to inform you about making decisions, you may be underestimating um, the complexity of the investing in economic world, as well as you um, may, you know, kind of um, not help your investment returns, but harm them by mistiming your exit from the investing markets, as well as your re-entry. Um, so that one of the things that I actually kind of had to laugh and appreciate about the negative news when it comes to geopolitical um, crises, which of course is not, not something to laugh about, as well as inflation, is that is, it has diminished our need to address the midterm elections and their impacts on market, which seems to be just a regular kind of habit that we have to um, we have to talk um, a disproportionate amount about politics and how they relate to markets um, often so that we can convince you that we don't have to completely change our investment strategy from one administration to the, to the next or one control of Congress to the next. Um, the reality is, though, there are some pretty persistent trends when it comes to midterm election years where the returns in these years, while typically positive, are kind of backloaded to the end of the year. And that's what you can see on the chart on the left. Um, midterm election years are more volatile. And often, if you took the average, um, you'd go, be going into October with negative returns. Um, and then by the end of that fourth quarter, you would have potentially, um, on average, past performance doesn't predict future returns, but on average, you would have positive returns at the end of the year. So that's something to keep in mind is that this is to, in the presidential election cycle pattern. This is a challenging year for markets um, and certainly markets do not love uncertainty. And there's a big question mark as to who will have control of Washington DC at the end of this year that may be impacting uncertainty that has nothing to do, um, we would argue with inflation and geopolitical um, conflict. Um, also, when you have um, conflicts like we do in Europe right now, um, those tend to harm investment performance over the shorter time periods. But if you invest um, ongoing based on the, that news, then you tend to um, miss out on returns because those returns tend to shift to positive over six and nine month periods. So that's something to keep in mind. And all of this kind of adds up to something that we talk to you about, whether we're in good markets or bad markets, which is if you don't have a process that is built to be invested over time, you're, and you think that you can outthink markets, then you often can tie yourself up and miss out on very important components of return. So for example, if you miss the um, worst days of the market, then um, you know, great, you have a crystal ball and you can really make a huge difference in terms of your performance versus being invested all trading days. But missing the best days of the market are actually very penalizing. Um, and oftentimes those best days in the market are happening at the same time or within the same time period as the worst days. One example, just from last month, um, you know, Melissa mentioned that we were down 13% is kind of our low point for the year through last week. Um, we had a huge upswing just over a two week period in um, March. And so if you kind of lock yourself in because you feel like the negative news is going to become more permanent, um, you, you tend to um, provide opportunities for yourself to um, multiply the negative impact of your returns. Your time horizon is very, very important, and we incorporate this into our investment strategy and financial planning for you. So for most of our clients, if not all, they are investing for longer term time periods, whether this is because they are years from retirement, or if you retire on day one, you often have a 30-year 
period that you're going to continue to be invested in. And it's almost a coin toss when you look at any given three month period as to what will happen in the markets. About 66% of the time, your investments go higher um, if they're measured by the S&P 500 or US large company investments. And about 44% of the time, you're unfortunately didn't um, make more money. But as you accumulate longer periods of time, it's a three to one ratio of positive versus negative over a one year rolling period. Over any given five year period, it's better than 80% um, probability that you'll have positive returns and those continue to go. So um, this, is, this is all reinforcement that tells us um, that maintaining the process that we built, and I would emphasize that that also relates back to the very difficult bond market that we we are ex currently experiencing. Um, there's the same, you know, kind of um, lessons to be learned in terms of the future um, that don't assume that what has happened over the last six months is going to be the same as what happens in the future. When we look at what is working in markets or what is making it less bad, um, this is a look at different types of investments within U.S. large companies. I would emphasize that um, value is working, dividend um, paying companies are working. Also, um, you can see um, adjustments to bond portfolios so that you have either a shorter type of Bond, bonds that mature more quickly or different types of bonds, those, those tend to be doing better than um, just the bond average. Um, and you know, surprisingly, actually, some international investments have done better than US-based investments for much of the past year. So there are some benefits that we're experiencing right now from diversification. Of course, none of those are home runs that mitigate the entire negative returns of the market thus far. Um, but I would also remind you that we had surprisingly good investment returns over the last couple of years. And when you sign up to be an investor, which most of us need to do in order to be successful during our current um, working lives, as well as in retirement, then you're not signing up to get an average return any given year. You're signing up for long-term investing where you will get average returns over time, but there will be volatility in returns year to year. And just like last year um, presented double-digit return opportunities for some investors, this year, um, at least two, two year to date, um, has those negatives, but they tend to all roll up to an average higher return over time. So we really want to emphasize that we're not surprised that we're experiencing an environment like this. We deal in probabilities and we don't know what will happen in the future. But what we do know are processes that help investors be successful over time. The things that we remind you of are not all that exciting because we talk about them all the time. Um, but we would remind you to have a process and stick with it. And we help our investors that work with us um, to incorporate a process that works along with their financial plan. Do the things in your portfolio that will help you to um, be successful, including rebalancing and making sure you own a diversified portfolio. Follow discipline when it comes to your withdrawals. So we help to identify where withdrawals should come from, how much cash should be on hand, et cetera. If you have the opportunity to, and you're a saver, you might be able to accelerate investments in a time where they are selling for a lower price than they have been in the past. Um, also, in some cases, if you're in a lower tax bracket year, Roth conversions can be advantageous when markets are down. And then tax loss harvesting um, is also an opportunity that um, we manage in portfolios for tax taxable accounts. We could talk about that more offline with you, or we have follow-up presentations we'll include in kind of our summary notes for this call um, that talk about how to do tax loss harvesting. Also, and this um, sounds, you know, like, no, I came here to be educated and um, really think about the complexities and technical aspects of investing, but investing is a behavioral sport and managing the temperature of your emotions and focusing on what you can control and using financial planners and investment um, professionals to help you maintain um, calm and ease throughout investing strategy is a, just absolutely the number one job that we have is to both manage our behavior and help you to manage yours and, and emotions. And if you're feeling anxiety or stress about the way you're invested, then I would encourage you to reach out. Um, we can definitely discuss that. And then don't overcorrect based on predictions that you believe are certain while they're only a, 
a discussion of probability. So don't listen to the most outrageous headlines and then make major shifts based on um, shifts that would deviate from your process based on what um, an alarmist is saying. And then always follow the um, best practices from financial planning, have a financial planning, update it annually. I think one of the best ways to deal with a difficult market, which as we all said, comes up from time to time. And in fact, more regularly than you might think is to revisit your financial plan and see if any of the things that you want to accomplish have changed based on the changing environment. Boost your savings each year, and when you're retired, make sure that you're um, watching your withdrawals and, and um, using a sustainable withdrawal rate. If you have taxable investments, we think there are huge opportunities to be tax aware in the way that you invest in your strategies, and then make sure the other aspects of your financial plan, whether they're in estate planning, insurance, college savings, et cetera, are being addressed as you go. So I know I've said a lot and um, we packed a lot of technical conversation into the discussion today. I wanna make sure that people are able to um, hear um, answers to any questions they may have. And so if you have any questions, you can go to the Q&A section and just type them in. Um, Melissa, Alexa, or Hannah, what questions have you been hearing for clients that we might need to add or address um, when we talk about things? Well, I think we covered a lot of them here. Um, I think the biggest question that I hear from people is, you know, should I stay invested if, again, they're reading the headlines about the recession? And I think you did a great job of covering the reasons why we want to do that and just, um, you know, looking at it as a buying opportunity when the markets are down like this. Yeah, I think one area that is um, interesting is when you are either near a change or a threshold. So perhaps you haven't been an investor in the past, but you have funds that need to be invested or haven't invested as much. Well, um, we can talk about the method to becoming an investor. So we may have a strategy where we invest monthly over time, or, um, you know, we start slowly and, um, you know, statistically, usually it's better over long periods of time, as long as you have a longer time horizon to get the money invested. But like we said, we're managing emotions, behavior, we're dealing with humans and investing is a very human experience, regardless of what anyone tells you. Um, we agree with that. It's a human experience for us as well. Um, and so we can develop, there are ways to get invested that can get you away from feeling the need to time something perfectly. And, and that's definitely something that we do. Another like really flashpoint is if you're right about to retire or you're early in retirement. And so talking about the right cash amounts, talking about the general strategies that you can have to make sure that everything is working together um, and really hammering down the um, probability of success in retirement, which is something that, again, we're talking probabilities, but we, we do with both software as well as um, you know, double checking that against a variety of factors. Those are all critical components for you to not feel frozen and just you know, uh, very concerned, changing the retirement game plan, et cetera. The earlier you're able to kind of work with us to prepare for that retirement or those inflection points, I think the more advantage that you have, but for all investors, it's um, you're not alone if you're feeling stressed or uncertain. Um, and it there's nothing in this world of you know constant pings of information um, that speaks with uh, just like absolutely firm authority. Like, don't you know there's going to be this awful market? Um, it certainly gets your attention. Um, and it can be um, extremely alarming, but you know, we have processes that, like I mentioned, going back to 24 years um, of experience, I've been able to see a variety of people's lives as, as have all of us throughout our careers. And, um, and we know the strategies that work, that tend to work over time. I don't see any other questions. Um, 
but we will have a replay of this presentation. And I'm so appreciative of the people that listened in. Um, when we share the replay, as long as you're getting our newsletter, um, then you'll be able to see that as, as well as related um, conversation topics. Um, you can also follow us on social media, including Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and we always welcome you to reach out, email us if you have questions um, or give us a call. Um, and of course, I have to make sure to include our disclosures. Um, nothing is promissory. This is meant for educational purposes only. Got to make the attorneys happy as well. Um, and so we do these every three months. So we'll be reconvening again in hopefully summer since it's practically snowing here in Michigan right now for our clients around the country. Um, but we just appreciate you and Melissa, Alexa and Hannah appreciate you guys too. Um, it's great to get together to have this discussion.